Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are the one that can and do raise us up. I thank you once again, Lord. We are stand in amazement at these psalms that we are, are, are learning about right now, that you are speaking to our hearts so directly. Thank you, thank you, thank you. As so many of us sitting in this room have or will or are having difficult times and tough times and depth times. So Lord, thank you so much. And Holy Spirit, we just invite you to come today to each of our hearts and speak directly to us telling us what we need to hear. May we open our hearts to you. May we receive your word uh, to our hearts. We thank you and praise you that you care so much about us, that you love us so much, that you gave yourself in sacrifice so that we could have relationship with you. So Lord, we just commit this morning to you. I pray that you, this will be life-changing in all of our lives as we walk through, as we make our pilgrimage toward you eternally. We thank you and praise you for who you are. You are our mighty God, and you are our mighty shepherd. Thank you. Thank you. And we pray this in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, uh, welcome back. And again, I just want to thank you all so much for your expressions of um, concern and your prayers and texts and all the wonderful ways that you all have been reaching out to us. It's meant more than you will ever know. But uh, thank you so much for that. And today, in lesson 14, and next week is, tell me what lesson it is. Okay, I'm working on that. <laughs> anyway, yeah, we're, we're kind of, we had a couple ladies that did the wrong homework last night and all that kind of thing. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, so next week is 16. We've already done 15, remember? So uh, anyway, but today we're kind of following the, the, the train of thought that we learned about last week when we talked about how we go through tough times. And then this week, we're kind of continuing that theme, and we're going to be talking about, um, well, we'll talk about that in just a minute, but here's what I love. Look at the top of your, your book. Look what it says. What it's, what it's um, you know, Psalm 130 is all about. What does it say? Hope. Hope. And so I love how this follows uh, last week when we talked about perseverance. And then this week we're talking about hope. And it's such a, a great, great uh, train of thought. And it just ministers so much to all of our hearts, doesn't it? has to be. Again, this lesson is just for me. So you guys can go ahead and go on home. And I'm just going to stand here, talk to myself. But anyway, just so, so um, encouraging. Many of you know the story, but my grandfather... <clears throat> was a uh, missionary in China. And he was there, um, he, they were just getting ready to leave on furlough and he sent my grandmother all home. And he had to stay because it was during one of the wars. And um, he, because he spoke Chinese, the American forces were coming in to help the Chinese armed forces. And so because he spoke Chinese, he was asked to stay and be a liaison um, officer between the American troops and the Chinese troops. And so one day he was in an army jeep and they were winding around narrow, windy mountain passes. And as they were winding their way, all of a sudden this massive semi tractor trailer, whatever they had in the day, came barreling down toward him. And I don't understand how all this happened, but he just sort of automatically, sort of a response, stuck his arm out to push the, the truck away from him, which was kind of coming in the passenger side, he just kind of pushed it away. His arm got stuck between uh, the, the two vehicles. And long story short, they had to amputate his arm from just below his shoulder. And so in the, uh, he knew he needed to let my grandmother know that he was gonna be delayed a, a bit before he could get on that plane and get on home to the United States. And um, in the day, guess what? They didn't have cell phones. <laughs> in fact, you know, they had the old-fashioned uh, uh, phones. And, um, but to, to talk from one continent to another was just not, they just didn't do that. And so he used the form of communication that was big in that day, which was called the telegram. telegram. 
and um, which is something I don't think it even exists anymore, does it? I don't know. Does it? I don't know. Really? Okay. I'm going to send you a telegram next week. How about it? <laughs> anyway, so he sent her a telegram, and he, you know, he kind of stewed about how, how he should put this, but he said, I was in an accident, period. Um, I've lost my arm, period. And then he ended by saying Romans 8, 28. And say it with me. For all things work together for good who are called by God, who love God and are called according to his purposes. And so this was, you know, way in his earlier years. When he retired, he got back to the United States and he retired um, from serving in China. And he was kind of settling in in Georgia and enjoying it and all that. He got a phone call from the mission board. And the mission board said, Dr. Tori, we just want to let you know that um, we have, this during the Korean War, and we have all of these refugees coming down over the North Korean border into South Korea. Many of them have lost limbs. We feel like this might be a real area of, of um, being able to minister and teach them about Jesus. So would you consider, I know you've retired, but would you consider going back to Korea? Now, he spoke Chinese. He didn't speak Korean. And, um, and lead that and, and get this amputee center started and figure out how to, to talk to the, you know, the Koreans about, about Jesus. So he went back and spent, I don't know, I can't remember all the details. I have to call my historian brother, family historian brother. And, um, but he was there for multiple years after that. And he, they built this amputee center. Many, many, many came to know the Lord. I think that Korea is apparently, from what I'm hearing, one of the most receptive to the gospel. One, I think the biggest church in the world is in Seoul, Korea. And um, so going back to the telegram, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. Wow. Is that an example? And that needs to be an example to our hearts that the things that we deal with in our life, yes, first on your outline, suffering is real. Suffering is real. But in the midst of it, God is going to use it for good. And that's kind of the sort of the theme of this lesson that we're going to be uh, learn, studying together. Last week we talked about, quote, tough times, times that call for perseverance and trusting God and so forth. And we talked about how we have tough times because why? Well, we live in an imperfect world and we're imperfect people. And we live with imperfect people and we associate with imperfect people and the list goes on. But what, what the psalm is, what um, we talked about last, last week is that in the midst, in the midst, God is working. God is working. We need to trust him. Psalm 120, 130 calls troubles, tough times, or suffering the depths, the depths. Uses a different word, same idea. And it gives us hope, which is a theme of this this verse uh, of this uh, passage, this psalm. What are your depths? What comes to your mind as we talk about tough times, suffering, depth times? Is it financial, marriage, children, relationships, loneliness perhaps, health, guilt? I don't know what yours is, but every one of us in some varying degree has some sort of depths in our lives, don't we? Yes. We all have them. Someone said, sometimes the Lord calms the storm. Sometimes he lets the storm rage and calms his child. Isn't that good? I love that. I'm going to read that 10 times every day, I think. <laughs> anyway, the, the psalm grapples with the depths, giving guidance and perspective to the pilgrim on the path of faith as we travel with depths in our lives toward our Zion, toward our heavenly home. As we're journeying along, as we're following the footsteps of um, the, 
the Jewish people going to worship in Jerusalem, we're following the same pattern, aren't we? We're just not traveling through Israel, but we're headed toward our Zion, our heavenly, heavenly home, our heavenly home. Thank you to Jesus. So I'm going to read the psalm, the whole thing, and then we're going to pick it apart verse by verse. Verse 1, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared, feared. And remember, that doesn't mean troubling in your boots. That means respect, respect, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning, more than the watchman for the morning. O Israel. And now that would become include us, wouldn't it? He's talking to his children. And now through Jesus, we're his children. So that's a reference to us as well is as the Jewish community. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord, there is steadfast love. And with him is plentiful redemption. He will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. So A on your outline, we should first of all, acknowledge our suffering. Notice it in verse, the first part of uh, one, the psalmist says, out of my depths, out of my depths. In other words, he's saying, okay, I'm in the depths right now, and guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to cry to the Lord, cry to the Lord. I'm going to communicate about it. I'm going to acknowledge that I'm going through some rugged times here. And um, so he's honest about that. By bringing it into the open and voicing it through prayer, it shows that, quote, depths, are not slightly embarrassing things to be locked in the closet, things that happen to unspiritual people. You're struggling right now? Well, oof, what kind of sin do you have? Why are you struggling? No, this is something that happens to everybody, everybody that has to live in this world. I've told you the story before, but um, long ago, when we had first moved to South Florida, uh, we were in a church, and um, I would, every Sunday, you know, I would get the children ready, and it was usually... You know, oh my goodness, mom, I left my shoe in the house, so I have to go back and pick up the shoe or something. Or the kids would be kind of, row, 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 give me that or whatever in the back seat. And by the time I got to church, I was like, oh. and there was a greeter that was at the same door um, every week. And um, it was right by the children's division. So I dropped the children off, kind of take a, brief, uh, take a deep breath, and uh, walk toward that door to go into the, to the preaching place, the sanctuary. And um, he would say, good morning. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> and he'd say, how are you? And I'd say, well, you know, oh, OK, you know, how are you? And he'd say, fantastic. And every single Sunday, he was fantastic. And I think, whoa, what world do you live in? <laughs> you know, I want to move over by where you live anyway. But um, we are to acknowledge, we are to acknowledge that we have depth times, aren't we? Number one, first, acknowledge it to others. And this is not necessarily in the, the order of importance, but one way that we can acknowledge it is to others. And, you know, what an example and privilege that we have here in our Bible study through the prayer ministry. Thank you, Pam V., who spends so much time, at, sometimes in the evening, sometimes in the afternoon, sometimes first thing in the morning, communicating those prayer needs. Thank you, Pam. Wow, what a blessing that is that we can acknowledge and pray, pray for one another as we go through our depth times in our lives. And then around the small groups. I love how you all share uh, your, your prayer needs with each other so that you can pray together. And uh, we have a couple of tables um, at night that it's like, are you ever going to quit praying? Because they, uh, they're hanging out and praying, praying, praying. I'm just kidding. I mean, it's a wonderful thing. But we're like, OK. <laughs> anyway, but what a blessing to acknowledge to other people our depths, right? That we can acknowledge them and pray for each other and lift each other up. Um, also, maybe you have personal prayer partners. You know, I, I remember um, 
one gal that used to come before she moved, she has a group of women that she prays with every single morning. How wonderful. That's acknowledging, acknowledging our needs, our prayer needs. Part of the Christian fellowship is not to gossip <laughs> about, hey, did you hear about, huh? No, it's not about gossiping. It's to help one another through prayer in our depth times in our lives. More importantly, like the psalmist, our suffering should be set squarely, openly, passionately before God. That's even more important, isn't it? Personally, uh, share it before God. So number two is to God. And that is what the psalmist is doing. He is acknowledging and expressing it. We talked, as we've talked in the past few weeks, we live in a culture where everybody's goal is to be perpetually healthy and constantly happy. That is the goal of our culture. And sometimes I think we can kind of fall into that sometimes, can't we? Where we say, oh boy, you know, yeah, I, that would be wonderful if I didn't have to have any depths in our, in our lives. But then would God be able to really work with us and move us forward in our lives in the areas that really count? There's a, um, uh, Bob's administrative assistant and dear friend of mine is Benetta. And um, she and I, when we have lunch, we go to this one little restaurant. We always go to the same one. And the host, this, the, um, what do you call it? The host, host, it's host. Yeah, it's actually a man, so I wouldn't be hostess. But anyway, <laughs> anyway and um, he's always there greeting us and seating us. And we always have a fun time with him and everything. And um, you know what I'm talking about, Maria. And um, he, we said to him one day, hey, we're just getting ready to say the blessing over the food. Is there anything we can pray for you about? And he goes, hmm, yes, health and prosperity. And we, were, we just kind of looked at each other and thought, mm -hmm, well, okay. So we prayed for health and prosperity for him and that he would come to know the Lord so he could really understand what health and prosperity is all about. But anyway, uh, that was an interesting, you know what I'm talking about. Culturally, everyone's greatest goal is to be happy, happy. The difference between our culture and a pilgrim is, here it is, our focus. Our focus. What are we focusing on? B, we must determine our focus. Our culture wants us to be free of suffering as quickly as possible and to ensure ourselves against any pain. We don't want any physical pain. We don't want any emotional pain. We don't want any any kind of pain, do we? And we, our culture is, you know, helping us to, to figure out how to be free of suffering. A pilgrim, here it is, wants to find God in the midst. God in the midst of suffering and have his perspective and learn from these times. What are you trying to teach me, Lord? What can I learn? How can I grow in my relationship with you? How can I grow in who I am? as a person. What is your perspective? Number one, question to ask, the question to ask is, what can I learn? Not, why me? Oh, I can't believe I have to go through this. I just had that problem last year. How come I have to have another one this year? Rather than having questioning, 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 why, 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 our question needs to be, okay, Lord, what can I learn in this, through this? How, what can I learn? And many times, uh, in the last months, we've heard people within our Bible study community that have said, yes, I'm going through rugged times, but boy, the things that God has taught me. Yeah. We've heard that, haven't we? Yeah. That's such a blessing because that gives us faith and courage to face what we're going through yeah. and to know that God will be there. God will speak to us. God will minister to us. This is what the Lord has taught me. That needs to be our genre as we go through the depth times. Clearly, um, uh, the Lord wants to speak to us in that time when we have that, uh, that mindset of, what can I learn? How will you use this in my life, Lord? When we have that mindset, God will use it. Number two, the response is to face it with faith. Face it with faith not to, ab to avoid the depths, quote unquote, with terror. Oh my goodness, I can't believe this has happened. No, <sighs> the Lord knows about this and I need to have faith in the midst of what I'm going through. 
what are you teaching me? Lord, you're there. You were there. I have a, a friend who never will go to the doctor because she says, I know I've got something going on. So if I go to the doctor, I'm going to find out what it is. So I don't want to know. So I'm just not going to go. And um, that's kind of sometimes how we, we act, uh, you know, when we're concerned about going through those depths in our lives. We don't want to avoid because the deep places can bring deep devotion. The deep places can bring deep devotions. Deep devotions is brought about by the presence, capital P, of God. Capital uh, presence of God, of God. Someone said, he that cries out of the depths shall soon sing in the heights. Isn't that good? Often when they're singing in the depths, he cries out of the depths, they will soon be singing in the heights. How is that possible? The key is whom we are crying out to in our depths. Suffering is real, but next on your outline, God is real. God is, is real. Look at verses one and two again. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. You see that the psalm, you can hear the psalmist, he's crying out to the Lord. All the suffering is expressed by the psalmist in the form of a prayer. He's saying, God, God, listen to me, hear me. I need you. I'm going through a difficult time. I need your presence, Lord. Please hear my cry, he's saying. Notice that God's name is mentioned eight times in this psalm, in eight short verses. That's a lot of mentions. That's a lot of mention. You see where the mind and the heart of this psalmist is going. He is reaching out to God in the midst. A, he, talking about the Lord, is present in suffering, in suffering. The presence of God in suffering is very real and obviously taken very seriously by the psalmist. We hear in the psalm, a beloved daughter, son, crying out to a beloved father, like he's saying, Abba, Father, Abba, Daddy. Remember, uh, those of you who studied the Sermon on the Mount, we learned the first time in history that uh, God was called, because Jesus promoted it, to call him Abba, which means Holy Papa, basically. Holy Papa. That's a very personal name. And so uh, we can hear him saying, you know, this is your daughter. This is your son. I'm crying out to you, Abba, Holy De Papa. I'm crying out to you. That is where we are to be, to know that when we are in the depths times, we are to see the love of our Father. That is what the psalmist is expressing. You know this verse. It's one of the all-time most profound verses, I think, in all Scripture, Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, hmm, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or the sword? For I am sure, of oh, verse 38, for I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, or things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from what? The love of God through Christ Jesus. Wow, wow, wow. This is such a wonderful reminder of who he is. Because, be on your outline, and I'm just going to run through these, it, through the verses of what, who, who the psalmist presents God to be in our lives. Number one, one who is caring and personal, it says in verses one and two. Number two, one who forgives sin, verses three and four. Number three, one who comes to those who wait and hope for him, verse five. Number four, one who is full of love and redemption, verse seven. Number five, one who makes a difference, verse eight. One who, number six, one who acts positively toward his people, verses four through eight. Number seven, one who is not indifferent or rejecting, verses four through eight. Eight, did I say something wrong? Slow down. Okay, maybe I should start all over again. <laughs> One, caring and personal. Two, forgive sin. Three, those who come to wait and hope for him. 
one who is, number four, full of love and de redemption. See, I'm slowing down for us all. I can't even say them right. Anyway, uh, number five, one who makes a difference. Number six, one who acts positively toward his people, verses four through eight. Number seven, one who is not indifferent or rejecting, verses four through eight. One who is not delayed or indecisive, verse eight. Number nine, one who is generous in his love and care, verses seven through eight. And that's just sort of like an outline of who God is that the psalmist presents to um, the readers and the, the sayers of the psalm, whatever that word is. I'm trying to think of something, but anyway. Did you all get it? Good. All righty. C, his names are significant. We, talk, we just talked about all those that we wrote down, nine uh, areas of what he's like. And then C, his names are significant. The psalmist use, uses the name Jehovah and Adonai. Now, in English, they all say Lord. But in Hebrew, there is a huge significance in the different names of God that are used throughout the Bible. Well, in Hebrew, um, there is the names used of God have a very different significance, whatever the name is. And in this psalm, he uses Jehovah and Adonai. First one, number one, he is Jehovah, Jehovah. The psalmist says, I cry to you, Lord, Jehovah. Um, and as we talked many times, uh, so many times before, Jehovah is Israel's covenant name for God. Remember when Moses met God at the burning bush and God called Moses to go back to Egypt and to free his people. And Moses, um, he was just right on it. Yeah, I'm going. No, he was not. He was typical, all of us. And he said, well, who, you know, when I get there to Egypt, for goodness sake, who should I say sent me? And God said to him, I am that I am. I am that I am. Uh, that just gives me chills to even say it, that he is there, always will be, always has been. I am that I am. Let me just show you my power, Moses. <laughs> I am that I am. I am Israel's covenant God, is what he was saying. In the depths I cry to you, covenant-keeping God. You are unchangeable. You are I am that I am. You are unchangeable. I can count on you in my depths, quote, unquote. In those times when we feel overwhelmed with the changes in our life, he will never change. Isn't that a comfort? Isn't that something that we can just build our lives on? The he will never change. We can change. Our circumstances change. All kinds of things can happen in our lives, but he will never change. He will never change. Again, the character trait of, of being unchangeable, the same yesterday, today, and forever, as it says in Hebrews 13, 8, is what we can bank our lives on, is what we can build our lives on. That's foundational for us, especially as we go through the depth times. The aspect of God that the psalmist is contemplating and remembering as he cries out to God in his depths is Jehovah, the covenant-keeping, Israel's covenant God. But he also uses the name Adonai, Adonai. Uh, number two, he is Adonai. And Adonai means Lord and Master. It indicates a personal relationship with God. It indicates the Lordship of God, his total possession of me, and my total submission to him. I don't run my life. <laughs> I think I do sometimes. I act like I do. But he is the one that runs my life. He is in control. He is my master, and he is my Lord. And my job is to submit to him. My job is to submit to him. Verse 2, the psalmist says, Adonai, hear my voice. Adonai, hear my voice. He is saying, Adonai, you know me. We, we have a personal relationship. You know my voice. I'm your daughter. Um, you, you know, you, when I come to you um, because you're Adonai and you're my master and my Lord, you, you know me. And so I'm coming to you. Um, I think I've told you, I'm telling all these repeat stories today. Sorry. But anyway, 
um, years ago, Bob and I were speaking in a, a city out of, out of, out of town, and um, obviously out of time. If it, anyway, um, uh, and we had this routine that we would go through. We'd go up into the motel room, and he would go in, and he'd uh, get on the phone and, you know, call Benetta or whatever, and, or the kids if they were still home, and, you know, say, we're here, safe, blah, 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 touch base with the church. And meanwhile, while he was doing all those more important things, I was going down the hall to the um, Pepsi machine. <laughs> So he would get on his phone, and um, I'd grab, you know, three of his dollars off the counter and walk on down the hall and get to the machine and get us two Pepsis. And then I'd turn around, and this one particular time I turned around and went, I have no idea what our room number is. Where are we staying? And I'm like standing in the hallway, and I'm like thinking, what am I going to do here? I mean, this is just unbelievable. And I thought, well, I could go back to the front desk and say, hi, I'm Rosemary Barnes. Could you tell me? And well, how will they believe me? My ID is back there with my money, which I didn't take to the Pepsi machine. Anyway, and um, so I'm standing there going, what in the world? Am I, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And all of a sudden, I heard this laughter coming out of a doorway and a voice talking. And I thought, that is the voice of my beloved. <laughs> I know where to go. And, um, and that's kind of the idea here, that you know my voice, Lord, Adonai. You hear my voice. You know me. I have a relationship with you. We are connected. I'm your daughter. You are my Lord and master. Wow. You know my voice, and I know your voice speaking into my life. You are my Lord. I am totally committed to you. I have a personal relationship with you. I am your child. You know my voice. You've heard it before. Hear it again now, please. Please hear it again now, Lord. I'm coming to you in my depths times. This psalm, this prayer is so personal. It's like we're kind of sitting in on somebody who's having their personal devotions with God, that, he, that he's sharing his heart with God before our ears and our eyes, isn't it? So personal. And that's the way it should be for us. It should be so uh, instructive on how we are to approach the Lord in our depth times. So two great realities of the psalm are, first, suffering is real, but God is real and very personal and personally involved. I want to say that again. That is so, so important, isn't it? Suffering is real, but God is real and very personal and personally involved. We need to accept suffering in depths, times, but we believe in God. We believe in God, in them. We accept suffering, we believe in God, trust in Him, we're clinging to His hand like a child. Um, we have this favorite uh, family picture, and um, we're in North Carolina, this was years ago, Roby was probably about four or five, and um, you all would know this if you know the Highlands area, there's a high peak that you go up into the, I think it's Black Mountain or something like that, and you go up there and there's this um, swaying bridge, I don't know what you call them, but they're you know, sw yeah, the swing, you know, it's not like a solid bridge gone over. And it's over this ravine. And you look over the side and you're like, whoa, you know, if I should get through one of those rungs here, it, big trouble because it is so high up in the mountains. And uh, the picture is Bob and Roby walking across. And you can tell from Roby's face, he is terrorized. And he's clinging to Bob's hands with both of his hands, just holding as tightly as he can possibly hold on to uh, with both of his hands. That's the image. That's the image for us. Clinging, clinging to the Lord with both hands as we go through the terrorizing, swinging bridges of our life. Wow. So what we need to do is to remember Psalm 46, another one that we, we love so much, verse 10, be still and know that I am God. Cling to his hands. Know that he's there. Know that he's hearing. Know that he, that I have a relationship. I'm a daughter. He's my master and Lord. So what should I do? 
That's all wonderful, ethereal, and up there, and great way to start the thinking, but what do I practically do? How do I practically carry that out in my life? The psalmist then goes on to give a plan for how to live this out. He, he gives us a plan of how to, be, how to be practical in this, how to do this thing. It sounds great here, and we begin with thinking through the process, but then we need a practical, how do we do this? Suffering is okay, God is real. Now what? I need to wait and hope. I need to wait and hope. So first, A on your outline, I need to wait. Need to wait. Verse 5, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. In Hebrew, patiently expectant is the idea. I'm going to be expect uh, patiently expectant of seeing God's hand mightily in my life. I'm going to, number one, wait with expectancy. Expecting him to come to me in his love. I quietly wait for him to come into my life. Wait, wait, wait on him for him to do what he's going to do in his timing and in his way. Not in my timing, in my way. Because guess what? Even though we think this, his timing, his way is eons better for us, isn't it? because he knows the whole picture. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows every molecule of our body. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He know I love this. He knows the number of hairs that are on my head. I'm saying, Lord, please, could, could we just multiply those a little bit? I mean, <laughs> really? You know? But he know, if he knows, I don't know how many hairs I have on my head. I think it's like 10. But anyway, <laughs> he knows. He knows me that intimately. Wow. So. I, I, I can wait on him. And notice the repetition. The verse says it twice. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. The repetition implies a deep importance to pay attention, doesn't it? That, that, that he really means this in our lives, it intensifies the word wait. I am waiting, waiting. If Jehovah is asking us to wait for his timing, for his inter uh, intervention, then it's worth waiting with all our hearts to wait and wait and wait and wait and wait for his timing and his intervention. And doesn't that also say to you, expectancy says to make me watchful. It's not in your prayer time in the morning saying, Lord, please, you know, come and be a part of what I'm going through right now. And then saying, okay, now I'm going to go do the laundry, get to the grocery store, blah, 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 get on with my life. No, we're to be watchful. We're supposed to be expecting. We're supposed to see God in the midst of what we're going through. We're supposed to say, that was a God thing. Oh my goodness, look at that. And how many times have we had that? And how many of those have we missed because we have not been watchful and expectant for his hand? We need to make our minds go to that point of, of saying, God, I know you're in charge, but I'm, I'm going to watch for you in the midst. God accomplishes much in those waiting times. Waiting experiences faith and exercises faith. When we're waiting for God to, to come through and do something and, and uh, figure out how, what, what, what's going to come from this, this moment, it helps, us, it helps us to experience in a deeper way our faith in Him. It exercises patience. It trains submission of saying, Lord, pff, this is how I would order things, but I will lay it down here and I will submit to you because you are perfect. Your plan is perfect. And you are God Almighty. And you are my Lord and Master. You're my Adonai. So I will submit to that. And endears the blessing when it comes. The, the answer when it comes is so much sweeter, isn't it? Because you've been waiting, waiting, waiting with expectancy. You're watched for. You're looking for him and you're hearing him and you're saying, wow, that was a God thing. And so when the answer comes, it just brings it, uh, gives it such a, um, a sweetness to us. It reminds me of when um, I was seven months pregnant with Tori and um, I got um, preeclampsia or toxemia, whatever you call it. And um, I went, which? Eclampsia. Eclampsia. And, um, and I went into a seizure on a Saturday. And um, they whisked me up into surgery. 
and went ahead and took Tori. And um, the following day, I woke up in um, ICU, and Bob was in there. I don't know how they let him in the ICU, but they did. And I woke up and I said, whoa, where am I? what's going on? You know, looking around, and he says, um, babe, we have a baby girl. And so from that moment on, I kept saying, I want to go see my baby. I want to go see my baby. A nurse would come in to, you know, check my IV or something. I want to go see my baby. I want to see my baby. And um, so then another nurse would come in. I want to go see my baby. Please let me see my baby. And so finally the nurses came in at the same time at one point. And they said, if we don't get this, this mama down to see her baby, she's never going to get out of here. And so they wheeled me down and wheeled me into my little area there in my little hospital room and brought Tori all wrapped up in a little, you know, hospital blanket. Oh, the joy of that. The, the depth of seeing the answer in my arms. Wow. A miracle. A miracle. Absolutely. A miracle. And how much dearer it was because I had to wait for that moment. And after I had waited to hold that, that miracle in my arms. Wow. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Nurse Becky <laughs> saying it's a miracle that I'm standing here. It is. Wow. Maybe that's why my brain doesn't function sometimes. <laughs> or that I have 10 hairs on my head. I don't know. Anyway, number two. Next thing, we need to wait like a watchman. First, we watch with expectancy, waiting for him. And then next, waiting like a watchman, wait like a watchman. Verse 6, my soul waits for the Lord more than a watchman for the morning, more than a watch, more than watchman for the morning. We should be a watchman. In other words, watching, watching, looking, looking, waiting, waiting, waiting. Um, but even more so than a human uh, watchman. What is a watchman anyway? Well, it was a job that's kind of similar to um, sometimes on Tuesday night, we have a guard in the guard gate in the front just to make sure that everybody's getting in is safe and, you know, all those kinds of things. And um, he's just watching, watching, watching. Um, he's alert to dangers. He wants to be aware if somebody needs some help or, you know, their headlights go out or, or whatever. And he's there watching. And that's kind of the idea of the watchman. Uh, in the city of Jerusalem. But anyway, um, can you think of how, how boring that would be? Especially if you were being a watchman pre-cell phones and televisions and, you know, all that kind of thing. And, um, but here's the thing. Dawn is coming. And a shift will be over at some point. But while he's on shift, he needs to be watchful. Uh, there's, there's, th that's the picture that's being painted by the um, psalmist that we need to be like watchmen. Sometimes it's boring. Sometimes it's difficult. Oh, sometimes, oh, uh oh, there's a car over there. It looks like the headlights are out. I need to run and go help. There, there are times when there's a job that needs to be done. Much of it is boring, but we need to keep our eyes open and watchful, watchful, watchful is what he is saying. Number three, watch with productivity. A watchman also knows that he is watching somebody's property or somebody's safety. Uh, waiting doesn't mean doing nothing, does it? The security guard uh, that we have here on, on some Tuesday nights, he goes, he walks around, he checks the doors constantly, is on the lookout watching for anything that might be going on, looking over in the, the, the single mom village, does everything look okay over there? And Oh, there's a single mom parking, I need to keep my eye over there and make sure she's okay, and you know all that kind of thing. He's always watchful, isn't he? Or looking out, watching, means getting on, um, it also means getting on with our assigned tasks. How, what has is, what is God given me as a watchman? What am I supposed to be doing? Confident that God will provide the meaning and the conclusion, which is, again, another blessing of our urgent prayer ministry, that while we're waiting for our issues, we can be praying for each other's issues. Isn't that right? While I'm waiting for God to do what he's going to do mightily in my life, I can be praying for you and for you and for you and for you. And, and I can fill my mind with the positivity of looking to God in somebody else's life while I'm waiting for him to be in my life. It's confident and waiting, uh, waiting patiently expectant as it means in Hebrew. Patiently expected is what it means 
in Hebrew, waiting and watching for God, focusing on God moments, recording them um, in your journals, uh, um, talking about them. Oh, you will not believe what God did today. Well, I've been waiting for such and such. You cannot. It was such a God thing. And sharing those with one another, because guess what? Doesn't that encourage us? When somebody says, look what God did, then that makes us be more cognizant of how he's working in our lives. So what a wonderful thing that we can share, share, share while we're waiting. Waiting and watching for God, focusing on God moments, talking about them. First, so first I wait. B, secondly, I need hope. I need hope. We hope in two things. First, uh, second part of verse 5, and in his word I hope. In his word I hope. And then verse 7, O Israel, here it is again, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. Now, interesting, the Hebrew word for hope here is basically the same is, are you ready? Wait. Very similar. Hope and wait. And he's used them um, in different ways here in the verses. It means wait. What I do, wait on, what do I hope on is, number one, hope on his word. Hope on his word. Again, verse end of verse 5. In his word, I hope. In God's word, we get our strength as we wait for him. We study his word, believe his word, hope in his word, and live on his word. And I love this one. Are you ready? Jeremiah 15, 16. Your words were found, and I ate them. <laughs> they must taste like chocolate or something. I don't know. But anyway, I ate them. Is that dr dramatic? Uh, wow, so picturesque. In other words, I digest them. I read, I believe, I hope, and then I digest them into my life so that they are nourishing me as I go about my life, my day. Wow. Because it's his word, we can stand on it, we can count on it. It's a firm ground to wait on and to rest on. Again, how many times, we've talked about this so many times, uh, and you've shared with me and I've shared with you, how many times we've opened God's word and that's just the verse I need today and how it speaks to our heart. Wow, that's God. That's God. Waiting and resting on him. And then verse 7 again, hope in the Lord. Number two, hope in him. Lord here, used in verse 7 again, is Jehovah, Israel's God, their personal name for him. God has great things in store for his people, so we should have great expectations. We can put our expectations on God because, guess what? He is a very big God. If he can keep the stars in orbit, I think he can keep my life in orbit. He's a big, big God. How big is your God? We you allow him to do all that he has in store for you in your depth times? Or will you limit him by puny expectations? Hoping is not dreaming or having a fantasy or an illusion. It doesn't mean, oh, I hope it will happen. It is the confident expectation of God working. Confident expectation that God is working because of the love and power and redemption of God. Look at verse 8. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquity. It's, it's, uh, somebody said it's imagination put in the harness of faith. Faith in God, and I'm going to harness my imagination of what that could be. It means having a confident, alert expectation that God will do what he says he will do. He will do what he says he will do. Psalm 130 tells us that the big difference in, in life is not in what people suffer or if they will suffer, but how we deal with the suffering, the depth times in our lives, and to hope and wait on God through it all. Look at verse 7a again. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love. Wow, what a strong, strong verse. So a closing question. What stage are you in? 
You don't have to say it out loud. First and most importantly, can you call God Adonai? Is he your Lord and Master? Have you given your life to him? Has he, um, have you entrusted your life with him? Also, can you call him Jehovah, your personal God, your covenant God, the God that you have a covenant God? Or are you fretting and struggling in the depths, quote unquote, place? Or are you patiently waiting and hoping like a watchman? Are you waiting and hoping like a watchman? Let's pray together. <clears throat> Mighty Adonai, beloved Jehovah, we will hope in you. You are our personal God. You are our mighty Lord and Master. We can count on you. We trust you. Especially in the depth times of our life. We choose to trust you and we keep our eyes watchful for you in the midst. Thank you for who you are. And it's in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Adonai, Jehovah, our mighty God, and our great shepherd. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, amen.